I wonder, you know, if we could ever even observe what evolution looks like on a different gravitational influence, if it would be lightning fast, say they came from a planet that was much faster than us, that it was developing, an entire civilization could evolve, develop, and collapse in the Earth time span of an hour. Welcome back to the Certain Uncertainty Podcast and part two of our conversation about time, physics, and reality. In the last episode, we talked more specifically about the microscopic view and the individualistic view of time in your life. In this episode, we're going to go deep into the physics and the perception of time and how on a macroscopic scale in society and the development of nations and also the changes within astronomical physics that predict and help us understand the passing of time. How you doing, John? I'm doing well, you know, doing great, ready to get into this time. So I think the big question that we want to start off with is the physics. As we approach the physics of time and thinking about how gravity is the ultimate universal e equilibrium or equalizer of time and what we feel, how could we even start to comprehend the existence of intelligent beings on a gravitational difference or, or spectrum than we are on. Right. And, and, and so there's, if we go into physics, there's basically four forces that we're aware of, right? There's gravity, there's a weak intramolecular uh, force, there's electromagnetism, and then there's these strong force as they call it. And I would say that gravity is the binding principle of all of these. What generates the weak, the strong force, what generates the electromagnetic spectrum, what is causing molecule A to be attracted to molecule B. We call this gravity in a very simple sense, right? That there is some level of convergence and divergence in mole molecules, right? And, and that convergency is a, a, another label for gravity. And so, you know, just, just forewarn, if you're looking for the most up-to-date top research on physics and so forth, Rather than more our understanding of physics, then I would look into research papers, go to Google Scholar, because we're not going to get that in this episode. Today is more of an explanation of how these physical phenomenon can then bring into new imagined realities of time. And that's really what this is capitalizing on. The nitty gritty formulas, why these things are exactly the way they are you need to go into more in-depth research in academia fields because we're not going to cover that today. Exactly. Exactly. And I think the the question that has fascinated me for for most of my life is this this relationship between gravity and time in this world that we live in on this tiny, tiny little scale of the the time spectrum. And most interestingly to me is the the concept of time dilation, where this was this was produced in the the episode of or the movie Interstellar, where they go on to the ship and the ship, you know, travels down to the planet that's very, very close to the event horizon, which has an incredibly strong gravitational pull. And because of that, the guy who stays back on the other ship passes 27 something years while, while the two other characters are on the planet for a couple of hours. And that's blown my mind to think about in, in, in reality, in real life, where we have millions of galaxies and millions of planets and just it, astronomically large. Is there a planet out there that say, John, you could travel to that has a much stronger gravitational field, which means time travels much faster relative to you than to me. If we were able to communicate with each other, which is physically impossible to go through a communication between two gravitational strengths, but say I could watch, I could watch you somehow, theoretically, would you just be zooming around evolving at incredible speeds relative to me? So, yeah, I would say because we are carbon-based life forms, I'm just going to bring a little reality to this. Because we are carbon-based life forms, no, because I'll probably die, right? I mean, what's happening, carbon is a pretty small molecule and you have a loosely bound shell of, of electrons and this is what makes it great for life in our, in, our, in our Earth because we can easily attach new types of atoms and, and so forth and build molecules very quickly with carbon because it's such a small little entity. But because of that, when I subject it to larger gravitational forces, because the, the, the forces, the electromagnetic forces of the actual uh, atoms bound to carbon are pretty 
pretty weak, albeit relatively, it'll probably just pull off all of the electrons and it'll probably cause me to mutate, get cancer really quick and actually, you know, stunt me. Now, if I was able to say, not be a carbon-based light form, if I was maybe a silicon-based light form with a little bit larger uh, radius of, of electron shell, right? Uh, if you have that, then it would require maybe a bigger pull to actually start messing around with the electrons held onto the atom of silicon. And then you, I would say that it would change the rate of our evolution because, I mean, this is, this is then the, 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 why are we carbon-based life forms, right? Why not silicon-based life forms? These are, these are both atoms with four protons, right? Or sorry, not four protons with, with four valence shell electrons available, right? Um, and so, you know, they can accept basically four different types of atoms that combine do it without getting too much into the chemistry of it, right? The, the, the question though is why do we, why did, why did our biology choose a little bit messier, a little smaller of a molecule rather than a bigger, more stable one, right? And, and, you know, for, for computers, we always use silicon because of its stability. We don't know how to mess with carbon as well. We, we can, we can kind of mess with silicon on earth because it's a little bit more stable. It has an, a nice crystalline structure that is easily manipulatable relative to carbon, which is just crazy and sporadic sometimes. And so when the question is, well, how would we evolve with an increased gravity somewhere far, far away? Well, for, for just reality's sake, you wouldn't, you'd probably die, right? <laughs> our, our, our evolution has started here, uh, you know, billions of years ago with this type of gravitational force. However, that is not to say that we can't manipulate the stability of our own type of organism, right? We're, we're already building, you know, cybernetics in some sense, right? And, and that's where I really jump into it. It's like, okay, well, how do I then change my own carbon-based electric potentials or whatever to be a little more stable? Right. Then we can start playing around with time at that level, no matter where we are. Yeah. And I think the the interesting kind of theory and also reality behind that, as we try and consider what evolution on a large time scale would look like on another planet, but even to to the hypothetical situation, if if we could actually observe, say you had a super powerful telescope that you could watch in real time to a planet that was deep within the gravitational field of a large astronomical body. Now, in the relationship between where your your point of view and the point of view of that that planet, your time dilation is different. So, on that planet, time travels much faster or much much slower because you are so much closer to the large gravitational body as to someone who is very far away from it. And if you could have a super telescope looking down and watching what's happening on that planet, you still would see it in your relative time frame because as the light particles that are traveling out of that super gravitational field to your point of view, they will travel out of the well of strong gravity mm -hmm. into your field of reference and it will look like they are living at the same speed that you are. Right, because we have fields of gravitation, right? And, and this is, you know, simple Einstein stuff. Maybe not simple, but- Simple Einstein. Yeah, simple Einstein stuff, right? 1950s, right? We're, we're way ahead of that now, with, which no one has even been able to really develop too well, much he on. Just, it was just recently proved, the his, his theory of the relationship between time and gravity just uh, in the last I don't know, five or six years. Wow, yeah, I mean, I guess, well, was that rel relative to the 2016 event where we were able to detect gravitational waves the first mm -hmm. time? Okay, yeah. So then there you go. But yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing, right? You imagine these big, you know, three-dimensional lattices, right? And and the density of interaction is how I'll say it within these spaces is different, right? Molecules will be further attracted. And in the very process of increasing the speed of attraction or the, the magnitude of attraction, I shouldn't say speed to be specific, but in that process, we develop a physical phenomenon known as time, which is a relative metric of that magnitude of attraction in and of itself, right? And so this is where I think we get into some fun pieces. If the goal is to manipulate time and to maybe artificially generate an infinite or immortal plane of existence, well, then what happens when we start tweaking our own magnetic attractions, right? Our own atomic attractions and so forth. And it's very, very tough to imagine this because again, we are in a, in our own time scale. We are stuck in a current rate of, of magnetic potential. 
right? Exactly. So if you think about how we have to pretty much exist in this is reality without getting kind of too abstract down some of these ideas. It is really interesting to, to practice that thought experiment of trying to think about what it would look like if you were to control C, control V earth, if you could just take earth as its entirety, its ecosystem, its gravity, gra its own gravity, which we can very easily survive on and put it, you know, very close to something that has a much larger gravitational well, like a large sun, large, like a large black hole in the interstellar reference, the, the perceived time would not change because that's re that's relativity, but relative to something outside of where we are now. So if you could still have a frame of reference to where earth is right now in our sun compared to a much stronger gravitational field, it would feel the same regardless of where you are. But if you were to compare the two, time passes tremendous, at a tremendously different rates. If you could compare the two somehow, which is beyond interesting to me and an incredibly difficult physics question to try and even prove or even look at the, the connectivity between those. And I think we're not going to get too into the, the depths of this because it can go on infinitely, essentially. But it is interesting to consider those those comparisons of, of how we look at our frame of reference versus the larger scope. And I think that's a good transition into the next segment of what we're trying to talk about, which is we live in this, this day to day scope where, where events happen and things are changing and we may perceive entire cultures shifting, but when you actually zoom out and look at the, the decades and centuries that, that practices and cultures and, and even governments have existed these minute changes, are they, are they really that profound or, or are we still on a very large macroscopic time scale of development? Yeah. So on the notion of development there, I think it's very interesting because it depends on how you evaluate development is think for example, are we capped given our current time domain, given our current earth's attraction of molecules, are we actually evolving? I mean, we, we say like in the technological fields that we're evolving here and we're, we're gaining new technology and blah, 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 blah. But what does it actually mean to evolve as a species, right? Now, when we're, when we're thinking about the concept of time here, is evolution really being able to control the flow of this, this time, right? To be able to process more things within a single individual's lifespan, to be able to innovate maybe, to be able to make more relationships, more associations, right? And I think this is where, where it really becomes a metric game, right? Depending on how we evaluate development and progress, it can actually be relatively arbitrary as it relates to actually evolving as a species. And I think that's the challenge. We, maybe we are evolving as a society, as a civilization and so forth, but are we evolving as a species? I'm not sure because, well, our, our, our sense of time, our literal flow of how molecules move, that's not changing, right? We have this gravitational constant that is always there constantly applying the same types of behavioral constraints on us. And so when we're looking at the development macroeconomically, well, what is it on the basis of? What, what is this time, time scale domain that we're, we're focusing on? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a really great point. And it is such an interesting conversation to try and, to try and frame what the, the scale of evolution looks like in modern human beings as we continue to diversify our cultures, as we continue to diversify our genetics, as people have greater accessibility to move around the world and live in new environments and have, you know, new relationships and new foods and all these new stimuli that are affecting not only your epigenetics, but your genetics as they breed as a whole, which is really interesting. And I've always wondered, as we look back a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand years, we can very clearly see that there are physical and physiological differences in the, the homo sapiens that existed in those, those years and thousands of millennia or in the, in the millennia time scale, how, how short does that frame of reference actually come down to, to what rate, what is the minimum number of generations that you can observe human beings evolving in their brain size, in their 
their average height, all of these factors that are continuing to change. And, and, and the material composition, composition of these individuals might change, but does the actual evolution of these species change, right? If I plopped a homo sapien, right, a homo sapien, not, not anything earlier, like a homo erectus, which is 1.6 million years ago, I'm talking homo sapien, the most up-to-date human being, right? If I plopped a homo sapien from about, you know, a few hundred thousand years ago, this is a common question, grabbed a homo sapien from a few hundred thousand years ago, let them develop in our society, would we be able to distinguish that the modern day humans are more evolved than the prehistoric homo sapien, right? We took him from when he was a baby, right? So all of the normal learned behavioral mechanisms that you'd see are still going to be present within this homo sapien from way, way long ago. And you, he probably wouldn't even know. I, I think that he probably would not even know that he is different in any way, shape or form, right? And so what I'm getting at here is, can we actually evolve as a species given our current gravitational field and constants? I see. That's a great question because say we are at the, the margin of, of gravitational development that is a little bit slower, right? I mean, this is, this is our only frame of reference. Like we have not perceived any observable evolution anywhere else in the universe except for right here, right? All life has been right here. All intelligent life has been right here. There's nothing else that we've been able to compare against except for the development of planetary bodies. As we look at how long it takes the time scale for new planets to form and new stars to, to go through the, the life cycle of a star, those are on time scales that are astronomically literally larger than what we could even comprehend here on earth. When we look at the, just the age of our own planet, up until where we are now, the existence of human beings. I think the comparison is if you were to take a, a, year, a one year calendar and January 1st of that year is the, the beginning of the formation of earth to where we are right now, human beings account for the last, what is it like 22 minutes of December 31st of the year? Something it's so, so, so small. small. Yeah. It's so small. And I wonder, you know, if we could ever even observe what evolution looks like on a different Gravi gravitational influence if it would be lightning fast say they came from a planet that was much faster than us that it was developing an entire civilization could evolve develop and collapse in the earth time span of an hour which is it blows my mind to think about that that kind of stuff and it's in my hopes and dreams that we could even one day even perceive something like that. But here on earth, as we talk about the development of our own species and culture as a whole, we look at what we are able to perceive, which is our minute by minute stimuli of how you can take the things that are developing your own psyche, your own mentality, and then how you choose to train or teach your children and go through this time development of how fast are you introducing them to new stimuli? How fast is the next generation with the continued progression and development hand in hand of technology and human beings accelerating our own development? Is it for the better? Is it for the worse? Mm -hmm. will, will brains, will the brain of someone 150 years from now look drastically different than if we were to compare the difference between our brain right now to someone 150 years before us because of the accelerated amount of new stimuli that we have. Yeah, and I, one thing I wanna clarify, just because you're changing, right, you're evolving, doesn't necessarily mean you're becoming more successful as a species because the metric of success as a species is arbitrarily defined. And this is where we come coin terms like or a civilization one species or civilization two species, whatever the hell that means. It's arbitrarily defined. We can change. We're continually evolving at every single step, but whether or not that is successful for our species has yet to be defined. And I think it's important to point this out because yes, we could make drastic changes to our own biology. We could evolve, but how would that impact the surrounding environment, the surrounding magnetic field that we exist in, right? Because maybe, maybe the, game, the game of successful evolution is really being able to, you know, control the magnetic potential from A to B at that level, at that very, very small level that then we can be like, oh, we're feeling... I don't know. 
we're feeling not developed, well, let's increase the magnetic field, right? Let's increase the, the rate at which these, these, these atoms are going to be making interactions. Oh, we're stuck in an in innovation gap. Boom. We right there increase the magnetic field for Earth, right? And it basically changes how fast molecules are interacting and producing new things. The changing rate itself would be increased. And I think it's a very dangerous, but also a very promising idea in that if we really attack our own, you know, what is life, right? What, what is, is, is life a carbon-based thing? Is it a silicon-based thing? What is it really? And is it just some kind of convergent property of matter that is so unique because it is convergent and that everything else in the world is divergent? Is the simple contrast here that one entity is capable of converging, holding on, while the other is constantly feeling like it needs to let go, right? And I think from there, you, you arise the idea of time, depending on the convergence or divergence of these events. And in being able to evolve a, a macroeconomic scale, right, these are questions that, that you need to be answered, right? What is the relative rate of atomic convergence? Exactly. And that's an abstract, but also very realistic question that we can ask as we go through this this very short time span of our lives that we have to observe instances happening. And to your question of could we influence the the magnetic field that exists in the the rate at which we can develop or even evolve? Or could you could you isolate in a small, a small inf infinite box and accelerate evolution? Is there a way that we can hyper accelerate evolution on an observable scale? Because the only way that we can observe in our own time scale evolution is through beings that either multiply at the cellular level very quickly or have a much shorter lifespan so when we're talking about bacteria or plant life or mice as we get into m mammals it's it's increasingly difficult as we try to accelerate what the evolutionary scale looks like in our own observances, which is really, really hard. And I'm sure is a, a challenge many scientists face today. But when we look at periods of say decades, say we could only describe development in the frame of reference of decades. And as we go through our own cultures and we look at, okay, say you could only describe events and feelings and cultures in the, in the, t the tens. So say the eighties, only the eighties, not 81, not 82, the sixties, the 1490s. Let's go even, let's go even greater. Let's say every 50 years, it's only the first half or the second half of every century. You're able, you only have the vocabulary to describe events of the late fifties or the previous fifties. And then from there, I'm sure we could start to piece together, you know, general trends. And it's almost like, it's almost like a, a graph, like a, a parabola as you place individual points, the more points you place, the more granular your curve looks and the less points you have, the more broad the trend line will look. And in, in doing so, the, the, the reason why this is important is as we start to reflect back on how we got to where we are today in this certainly uncertain world, continually changing, the only way we are able to predict or try and predict forward is by understanding how we got here in the first place. Yes. Understanding is a form of communication, though. It's a form of interaction. To evolve, one might say, is to communicate, because in the process of communicating, you need some kind of physical substrate. In this case, maybe it's air and that we're talking to each other with, right? We're, we're basically vibrating the uh, atoms, the nitrogen atoms, the oxygen atoms in the air in order to, well, each one of these atoms is interacting in order to communicate something. And we just call it communication, but in reality, there is a gravitational constraint to the idea of communication in and of itself. What is the rate of communication? What is the rate that I can interact with my individuals? When I have a thought, for example, and then when I say it, right, you're basically learning about what I'm communicating in a past tense. When I say something, I'm thinking it, but then I say it and the time it actually takes for those molecules to interact and actually receive to your ear is at a delay. What I am thinking, my present reality is never going to be your present reality. You live in the past of my present reality so long as I choose to communicate it. That's very philosophical. That's really cool. I think that that gets me thinking on, on this 
new thought train from that of of as we look forward to to our current instantaneous imagination going forward, which once we were able to realize what our imagination was perceiving, it's in the past, which is just a, a weird philosophical paradox to think about. It makes me wonder what our evolution will continue to look like. And say, say for the thought experiment's sake, you had the ability to control this evolution or at least imagine what it would look like. I would think that it's going to be very biometric, like our biometric evolution, as we continue to combine bioprosthetics and different types of cybernetics. So if we had different types of cybernetics in our evolution as we go forward, it will hand in hand dictate the types of of socioeconomic people and cultures that have accessibility to these, say that we had the ability to give someone a chip in their brain or an addition to their, their musculoskeletal structure that made them stronger and faster or able to perceive words much faster. So there was a whole group, a whole population of people that were, were, were categorized into a new structure of culture, the, the bio integrated society. Biocasts. Exactly. Exactly. That could perceive words, say twice as fast as the rest of us. So you have a whole groups of people going around speed talking so fast that people who don't have these augmentations are able to understand what they're talking about. Therefore, these new biocasts develop and how people are developing in careers or in societies. And then you have people with and without these, these capabilities and these biocasts as technology continues to evolve with us, we are evolving with technology as a species, which is wild to try and think about. We are, we are a form of technology. We have, we are in a self, this sounds weird, but we are tools, right? And without being, you know, a douchebag is not what I'm referring to. I'm literally referring to a actual tool. We can, you know, fasten things. We can move things. We can pick up objects, right? This is what reality is, right? And in that process, we are in itself a tool for reality. And 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 here's the thing that, that it comes down to when, when you're talking about these cybernetics. When you're looking at, well, what are valuable cybernetics? I think the, the, general, the general area that you should focus in is, okay, well, what is the impedance of my communication? So for example, when I'm talking to you in person, I have the impedance of air and luckily air is not that bad of an impedance. So it's relatively quick that you understand what I'm saying and, and hopefully we're pretty close. However, when we're across consonants, right? Well, the impedance is pretty great, right? I can't say a single word and you'll actually understand me, right? Then I, I get on a, a cellular phone and it turns out the electrons are going to be able to travel across in the transatlantic line underneath the sea and be able to reach your ear at some point in time, right? What you're doing right there is just allowing the interaction that undergone in my own atoms to propagate to a very salient other interaction site, in this case, another human being. And I think in the, in the process of cybernetic creation, it really comes down to removing those impedance gaps, right? So in, in the context of me speaking to, to, to you, maybe I don't want to have to worry about the delay of the time sound travels. So we have these chips and radio frequency waves will actually travel much faster, right? And so then you'll be able to actually be more up to date in my present reality, right? And so that I think is where where you can really start to identify a market there, a whole. So mind blown, literally. So if you were to give you and I this communication capability, augmentation integrated into our brain, I could convey to you an entire idea that would normally take, let's say 300 words or five pages in a matter of seconds. Mm -hmm. We could fully communicate a full comprehensive idea. Like, okay, the movie, The Matrix. I need to learn how to fly an Apache helicopter. Done. I know how to fly an Apache helicopter now. Essentially, that that's what we're referring to. And if you were to take that out of the the sci-fi Hollywood realm and actually think about what this would look like on a global education and communication scale, our ability to convey information without misinterpretation. And then from there, you could take fields that are so wildly differentiated that could combine to produce further innovations and discoveries like things we've never seen before. Because now more than ever, the capability to synthesize new information and integrate that into your base learnings and understandings is becoming ever more competitive. And like the, the prime case of that is 
computation, computation, software engineering, data analysis, and statistical modeling for every single field that exists is so prevalent right now. Yes. And this, in my eyes, is either a big detriment to our evolution. I mean, well, I shouldn't say detriment to our evolution, but a detriment to our successful evolution and the idea that maybe our successful evolution is the ability to interact with others with the least level of resistance, right? And in that process, you basically establish the quickest communication line. Or another way to think about it is if you think of evolution as a constant experiment that is constantly trying out new options, what you're doing is speeding up the test reaction. You're speeding up the experiment. And to me, this sounds like a, a new frontier of exploration. If we can speed up the reaction, well, how much can we actually obtain in a shorter amount of time? That's where we start playing with our evolution without having to interfere with our own gravitational forces that are binding our own sense of time. As we escape our own limits in our biological five senses, right? When I have these vocal frequencies that are generated by my vocal cords, you know, that's inefficient. Sound is terribly inefficient. It rebounds on everything. Okay, well, how do we evolve? Well, let's think about those resistances in the way. And this is how we change as a species and I think become, you know, maybe a civilization two species or something like that, right? And, and, and it's, it's, this, it's this reality that, hey, we're, we're used to these, these types of interactions with others. That doesn't mean they're going to stay. It's not a static system. Our time scale is just really small because as humans, we only are able to comprehend what we call a, a few you know, decades at a time, maybe like 60, 70 years, 80 years, which is still such a limited amount of time to even process information. But that's also because the rate at which we can absorb communication is limited. So what happens when we increase that? How does our sense of time change? I'm sure lifetimes would, would feel like they double. If you could take three weeks worth of learnings and condense that into five days and use that information effectively, even faster to communicate new ideas, to accelerate innovation. This is, this is the, the billion dollar questions of how, how efficiently do we collaborate with, with others, with our education, with peers, with how we synthesize new seemingly distanced problems and take this information and continue to pass it from generation to generation. Because now if you take problem set A or subject matter A and subject matter C and combine them into this new modality of thinking, when you teach that to the next generation, are you going to teach them A separately and C separately and then the combination? Or will you only teach them the tools that came from that combination? Probably the latter. Mm. And then that will continue to exponentiate like a Fibonacci sequence. So you take idea point one, and you add another layer to it and you combine those and you add another layer to it and combine those. By the time you get to the, the 25th layer, you have massive amounts of, of breakpoints that are the combination of dozens of layers before that. But when you're at that point at the 20th layer and the fifth number, you're only looking forward from there. You're not evaluating every single layer that came before you, usually to get to, to where you are. It would take too much time. Exactly. Now you're only moving forward. You're only combining the next set of numbers and layers as you progress forward. And, and using that analogy in the frame of, of how we spend our time to learn, I think is why we are continuing to innovate at exponential paces because our, our learnings are only only as fast as the, the next frontier that we're, we're accessing and passing on. There's incredibly difficult levels of abstract mathematics and astronomy, but imagine trying to teach this level of astronomy or physics to people in the, f the 1500s. It would take them so much longer because their baseline is so much further ahead. So like right now, kids in elementary school are learning Mandarin from first grade regularly, as well as advanced levels of algebra in middle school, elementary school, and now going to these hyper-competitive high schools that are already teaching linear algebra, differential equations, multivariate calculus, where most often people didn't learn that until their first or second year of college. The baseline's slowly and slowly 
actually more rapidly getting pulled backwards. So the younger generations are learning these competitive skills even faster and faster. Yes. And at some level, you might even say language plays a massive role in the evolution of efficiency in education. How, when we look at language, for example, how is it that language structures influence the rate at which we can communicate? And in what topic sector do these languages influence? So I, I've basically been studying Mandarin Chinese for the last six years, and I've made some pretty interesting comparisons between Mandarin Chinese and English. Uh, the, the general note I would say is that English is very great for science, whereas Chinese is great for poetry. And there are different types of efficiencies with these languages, and I'll explain. So English, it's great for science because in science, you got a lot of big words, a lot of complex ideas, right? And you want space between complex ideas. So, hey, English, great. You got a lot of spaces. You got a lot of filler words. You got a lot of ands, buts, ifs, prepositions, whatever have you to help fill in the gaps between really big ideas. Great for science. Now, for social settings, it actually makes it very laborious to listen to people. And so I don't have time for it. It's like, just tell me how you're feeling. And it's like, well, I have to use all these prepositions to tell you how I'm feeling. You know, in contrast, in Chinese, they don't have this problem. They don't have the necessarily the prepositions to, to break up ideas. They just have literally little idea bombs and closed in pictographic character meanings. And these, these characters usually denote different types of feelings in and of themselves. I can say one word and it can communicate a very simple social thing, which would take many more words in English. And that's, that's, that's besides the point of actually drawing engagement and attention, because that's another attribute of the language itself. How does the language engage individuals and, and how does that communication then impeded or accelerated by the engagement, the interestingness of the language itself, right? Exactly. Exactly. And I think as we, we begin to bring it full circle, it's a fantastic reflective question that you can all ask yourselves is what is the language that you are using to effectively communicate your ideas and also learn new things in the language of maths or even the language of poetry or different languages, how we communicate with each other and those around you to continually develop and build new skills and collect new forms of interpreting things as you you progress toward your goals because you have the most valuable currency, which is time. And it passes only as fast as you observe these instances passing and create new stimuli for yourself. That's exactly right. And, and on that, just to somewhat wrap up here, it is in communication where you will find limits to your evolution. Depending on the number of mediums you choose to communicate with, where each language, each mathematical discipline has their own language, each one of these serves as a medium to then propagate interaction of ideas. This propagation of ideas then allows more change, more evolution. And so if you're curious, what does a successful evolution actually look like? Well, let's start making some changes. And at what rate? Because you might die by the time you figure out what this all means. Might as well make the change. Exactly. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. If you made it this far into the podcast and want to hear more content, please consider following us on Spotify, iTunes, or YouTube and sharing today's podcast link with your close friends. We hope this podcast incites you to start some interesting conversations and expand on some of the ideas we've discussed. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Certain Uncertainty Podcast, a podcast aimed at unveiling the certainly uncertain relationships between some of the most complex systems known to man. 